So I want to thank you for the opportunity to come in and speak to you today. Uh, as I thought about the theme for your, your event today, uh, I tried to take a, a three-pronged approach to the remarks that I'm going to offer you. So I'm going to talk first about the business of government, just at a very high level, kind of explain to you a little bit about what federal acquisition and contracting is. Um, then I'm going to talk to you about some specific trends that I'm seeing uh, in the federal space in terms of technology, uh, things that you might want to uh, think about uh, in terms of um, uh, evolving and emerging technologies that are benefiting uh, the, the agencies in the federal space, especially mine, Coast Guard, and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and then I'm going to try to tie it back to you at the end, and I'm going to speak about how uh, you can kind of position yourselves to be at the nexus of business and technology in the federal space. So with that, and hopefully in the process I won't bore you, uh, but with that I'll go ahead and get started. And uh, let me ask, uh, I think a couple of folks here are probably going to raise their hand. Uh, how many of you know what federal acquisition is? All right, a couple of hands, good stuff. So for those, let me get these glasses out. Uh, for those that don't, let me give you a, a quick primer, and I'm going to try not to bore you to death. Um, so federal acquisition, when you hear acquisition, you think sometimes uh, uh, acquisitions and mergers, right? That's, that's a little bit different. That's not, um, not really what it is in the, in the federal space. Acquisition in the federal space is really a, a system of complex disciplines and processes that allow the federal government to deploy capabilities. So when we need stuff, and we, we uh, as a government need a lot of things and have to outsource to get those things, uh, we have to stand up formal acquisition programs. And there are some, uh, some very specific budget processes uh, that the government has to go through in order to get a program approved uh, and, uh, and funded. Uh, once a program is approved and funded, then contracting kicks in, and that's, that's my world of work. And so I like to think of it as really where the rubber hits the road. Um, program managers need to get a thing done, and then they come to my folks, and we help them put things on contract so that they can actually execute the work. Uh, contracting is probably one of the most uh, complex uh, sub-disciplines within the acquisition life cycle in the federal government. Um, I'll give you a couple of thoughts about why that is as well. Um, we essentially take a program's high-level requirements and we try to boil it down into contractees, uh, you know, the, the type of language that a company can take and then actually action against and develop a proposal uh, on to, uh, to, to bid on a government project. Um, that's, that's challenging to do in a very fluid and, and oftentimes dense regulatory environment. So uh, there, there's something called the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the FAR, and, uh, and it, it's essentially the governing uh, document for contracting and, and acquisition professionals. It's 1,500 pages long, if that gives you any, any uh, you know, semblance of an idea of how complex it is. Uh, there are a variety of uh, rules and laws that apply to the contracting process. I'll just give you a couple of thoughts on those. Um, competition and contracting, so it's something called CICA, C-I-C-A. That requires contracting officers to compete the work. Uh, we're dealing with taxpayer dollars, and so we've got to be very transparent in our processes, uh, and we've got to give companies an opportunity to compete for the business. Uh, along those lines, there's uh, the Small Business Act, uh, the SBA. So. Uh, that requires us to set certain, uh, certain things aside uh, specific to uh, small businesses and companies that operate in socioeconomic categories. Uh, there's also the Buy American Act. Uh, I'm in the Coast, well, I'm not in the Coast Guard, I support the Coast Guard. Uh, Coast Guard buys a lot of cutters, uh, so ships. Um, the Buy American Act is really impacting us right now uh, because the, the current administration is very interested in making sure that we enforce it uh, to, to include uh, the components that go into the ships, making sure that a certain percentage of those uh, are being made by uh, American uh, manufacturers. So I, I'm just giving you a, a handful of, of the, the rules that we have to adhere to. So it's a very challenging um, career field uh, to be in for those reasons. Uh, 
so in a in a typical B two B business to business supply chain, uh, I think procurement uh, takes on a slightly different um, uh, posture than it does in the federal side because of this regulatory environment. Uh, but contracting folks really lend value to the mission. Uh, we're responsible for partnering with program folks, making sure that we put the right uh, strategies in place for them on the contract to make sure that uh, cost, schedule, and performance uh, are going to be supported by the company that's going to end up doing whatever the work is for them. Uh, we evaluate the proposals, lead teams through that process, award contracts, and then we have to manage those contracts. And that's really where the work is. So everybody thinks that uh, getting a contract over the finish line is the, the hard part. It's not. It's managing that contractual relationship for the next three to five years with that company. And in some cases, uh, we do 20-year contracts because we, we construct ships. It's a long contractual relationship. And uh, it's a, it's a joint partnership. Uh, you can't just be looking out for the government's interest. Yes, you, you have to also be supporting uh, the business and their interest as well. So all that to say that contracting professionals are in high demand. Uh, it's a very short-staffed career field in the federal government. And I'll actually talk about uh, some stats later on that will kind of emphasize that point. Uh, I think today in the federal government, right alongside HR professionals, um, uh, IT and cyber professionals, contracting professionals are probably in, in the most uh, uh, highest demand along with those other disciplines because of what they do for the agencies. Uh, contracting especially because it's an inherently governmental function. What that means is, um, for example, I report to a three-star admiral who reports to a four-star admiral at the, at the Coast Guard who is, who is the commandant. He runs the Coast Guard. None of those folks in that chain can sign a contract. But the folks that are GS-12s and GS-13s that are contracting officers and warranted to do so can. So, I mean, if you really think about that, that's, that's a high level of responsibility. Uh, and you can't outsource that to industry. Uh, that has to be a federal employee. So between it being an inherently governmental function uh, and then I think the, the requisite skill set that goes along with uh, doing that, that world of work. Um, it's hard to recruit for people and retain people uh, to do that job in the federal government. Uh, contracting folks port across different lines of business. So we interact with the lawyers. So we interact with the finance managers. Obviously, we interact with program managers. Uh, depending on what the program is, you might be interacting with HR. You might be interacting with uh, the ethics organization, uh, the privacy organization, you name it. I mean, you will literally cut across different lines of business in federal contracting. You also have to be a subject matter expert in, uh, in a world of work that is always changing. Uh, new legislation is constantly being introduced that changes the way federal contracting is being done, and so that's challenging to manage as well. Uh, and then I think, you know, one of the, the, the things that really kind of uh, – makes it also challenging is you have to have good interpersonal skills and sometimes somebody can be a great technician and very good uh, uh, in terms of uh, analytics but they don't have the communication skills uh, when you're dealing with you know integrated teams like that uh, with people that are might be in the room sitting down with you from HR from you know legal from uh, finance and, and the program side you got to be able to got to be able to communicate effectively, and sometimes that's challenging. You can have somebody that's a fantastic uh, analytical mind, but you need them to kind of come out of their shell a little bit and be able to, to lead that team. Um, and uh, good communication is how you do that. So those are just some of the things that kind of go into uh, the world of work that, uh, that is federal contracting. Now I'll give you a couple of stats just to give you an idea of kind of, again, coming back to this, this business of government concept, kind of what the federal government um, – uh, does in terms of its spending. So uh, last fiscal year, and the government is on a fiscal year cycle, uh, not a calendar year, so we go 1 October to, to 30 September is our, is our year. Uh, last fiscal year in 17, not the one that just closed, uh, the federal government writ large uh, exceeded half a trillion dollars in spend. So we spent, uh, and that's just on contracts. Uh, we spent over $510 billion, big money. Uh, 
we do these things called GWACs, government-wide acquisition contracts. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second in terms of um, category management and strategic sourcing. Uh, but spending on those types of vehicles that, that kind of consolidates uh, uh, best-in-class uh, approaches, uh, that rose to $13 billion. Spending with small businesses, um, $110 billion last year. So of that pie, of that $510 billion, $110 billion of that was to small companies. And, and within the small business community, again, you have a variety of different socioeconomic categories. Some of those are women-owned businesses. Uh, some of those are service-disabled veteran-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses. Uh, some of those are businesses that are located in particular labor surplus areas. So $110 billion uh, with companies in that area. Uh, and then we do these things called simplified acquisition, where it's not as complex. Uh, we really just need to get something done and, and get some, some quotes in and, and streamline that process. And uh, we spent $22 billion uh, in simplified acquisitions. And uh, I was talking a little bit earlier about the rules changing. Well, the rules there are going to change. Uh, the threshold is now moving from 150 k to 250 k uh, 250000 And so the work that we do in the simplified uh, acquisition world will, will actually, I think, increase. Just a couple of stats to kind of to let you know, you know, uh, how we're spending our money. One last one for you. Uh, fixed price contracts. Uh, Basically, I'm not going to try to, you know, give you a 101 on the different contract types, but fixed price contracts shift uh, the risk onto the company, uh, and it's, it's more advantageous for the government to do fixed price contracts. Uh, we are every year increasing the amount of fixed price contracts that we do for that reason. So industry is having to get creative uh, in figuring out how they're going to manage their own risks in order to execute in that kind of an environment. Uh, category management. So that's nothing more than uh, aggregating your demand. All right. So if if the Coast Guard, for example, is all everybody's buying boots, well, then we should figure out how much how many boots we're going to buy over the course of five years and put a contract in place where we can actually leverage economies of scale and uh, and get some efficiencies out of that and uh, and and get the companies to to give us some price discounts. So that's, that's kind of where the federal government is going in general, and they're, and they're really doing it in the IT arena these days more than ever. Uh, we're trying to attract non-traditional companies. Uh, so there's a lot of talent out there in Silicon Valley and other areas of the country and, and companies that are standing up but not doing business with the federal government. And I think that's just because, you know, they don't, they don't think about it. They think that their markets are elsewhere. And we're trying to attract those types of companies to come in a little bit more. Um, another one is uh, just streamlining uh, the process and then trying to get to rapid prototyping. So we're trying to, we're trying to get uh, different mechanisms in place where we can get companies uh, in an R&D space, re uh, research and development space, and, uh, and get them kind of a little bit more mature in where their technologies are so that we can actually have a competitive landscape to, to do something with when we want to enter into contracts. So again, those are just some, some trends uh, that are happening uh, in general when it comes to the business of government. Now I kind of want to talk about some of the technologies, the specific technologies that I see uh, emerging, especially in the, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security space. So uh, before I do that, uh, a quick primer on DHS. Another quick round of hands. How many of you are somewhat familiar with the Department of Homeland Security? There we go. I expected almost every hand would go up in, in, the, uh, in the room with that one. Um, so in 2002, uh, 22 different federal entities were combined to create the Department of Homeland Security uh, after the 9-11 tragedies. Uh, and, and DHS is a cabinet level uh, department. Uh, several core missions, uh, and you're probably very familiar with these. Preventing terrorism and enhancing security, securing and managing U.S. borders, enforcing and administering immigration laws, and safeguarding and securing cyberspace, and also ensuring resilience for disasters. The largest, uh, depart or the largest component agencies within the department are uh, obviously the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, Customs and Border Protection, 
the Transportation Security Administration, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. There are, there are several others, but those are the big players. Uh, that, that does not comprise the DHS enterprise, though. The DHS enterprise is, is comprised of all those agencies plus state and local law enforcement and industry, and specifically within industry are technology partners. Um, we cannot do the mission without having companies in there uh, offering innovative solutions to us. So what are those innovative solutions? A couple of things I see. Uh, before, I, before I do that though, the reason that it's important, every, almost every hand in here went up because uh, DHS literally has millions of touch points with the American public every day. TSA alone touches two million citizens that fly on a daily basis. Uh, so DHS, I think, has really one of the most relevant uh, missions of our time. And so we need companies uh, coming in with good, uh, innovative technology solutions. When you're, when you're interacting with that many folks, you're collecting a lot of data. How many of you have heard about big data or know what that means? Okay. So taking in very complex data sets, uh, figuring out how to house those and how to action against that data. That's the, the short of it. Um, so the technologies that I'm going to talk about kind of all surround big data in some way. Uh, biometrics. So biometrics. Identity is absolutely the new currency. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the ability to verify uh, your identity, I mean, there, there are entire markets around it these days. Uh, DHS, several components within the department collect data in the course of the interactions uh, with the public as we're executing the mission. We're in the process of revamping uh, an identity management, a very large identity management system uh, within DHS. It's one of the largest in the federal government. We're doing that because we need to uh, bolster our ability to, to have better uh, image quality when we're doing fingerprints and so forth. Uh, and better matching performance. So we want to make sure that we're matching the biometric to the right person. Um, and, and, and this may sound a little big brother if you've ever read the, the, the book uh, 1984, but a lot of these uh, biometric services are actually in support of citizens. So as we're doing that new system, we're looking at the advancements in biometrics. So it's not just fingerprints anymore. Uh, iris is actually a better biometric to capture than the fingerprint. Uh, voice recognition, I didn't think that was a thing. That's a thing. Voice recognition is actually incredibly accurate. You would think that people can throw their voice and all that, but uh, there's sophisticated technology that can pick up on whether or not that's really your voice or not once they've, once they've established a baseline and started to match it. Uh, and then facial recognition technology. So Customs and Border Protection and then uh, the Transportation Security Administration are both now actively trying to roll out facial recognition uh, for boarding passes. So biometrics is, is here to stay and it's an emerging technology in the DHS space. Uh, machine learning. So predictive analytics. Um, that's technology that can get smarter over time. We're using that in a variety of ways. So we have technology like the, the screening uh, uh, technology at the airports. We're using machine learning to try to improve uh, the, false, uh, the false alarms on those machines to make sure that uh, the machine isn't setting off when it's not supposed to, for example. Um, CBP is using machine learning and predictive analytics uh, as they're developing uh, travel standards. And so they're trying to speed up their ability to automate those standards. So we're using machine learning there. Artificial intelligence scares me a little bit when you, when you hear that term, right? And what does that mean? But artificial intelligence, it's, it's here and it's here to stay. Um, imagine this, imagine, you know what a bot is, all right? Uh, so imagine a government powered bot. Uh, kind of uh, scrolling around your social media. So uh, a government powered bot that's on Facebook or, or on Twitter, but is equipped to be able to know when somebody is in need of uh, response and, and support during a hurricane, right? 
So a lot of people will, you know, right, right after uh, the event has happened, they're, they're on social media letting their, their loved ones know or just people around them know uh, where they're at and that they're safe or whatever. Well, that's useful information, or if they're not safe, okay, that's useful information. And uh, if we're able to kind of mine that information and then use some uh, artificial intelligence, maybe we can deploy some logistics uh, to help those folks out a little quicker. Just, just some thoughts about how artificial intelligence is being looked at. Um, cyber, you've all heard that term, right? Cybersecurity. Uh, we are doing some things. We partner with a lot of uh, universities. We, uh, we did a project with MIT. Uh, our science and technology directorate partnered with MIT and developed some software that is going to help cybersecurity analysts pick up on uh, threads uh, on the internet chatter uh, that kind of hints towards uh, cyber threats. So if, uh, if people in cells out there are kind of talking up potential cyber, uh, cyber threats, this technology is able to kind of mine the internet and figure out where that is. I know, it's a little sci-fi, but it's actually, that's actually useful information. Uh, that kind of technology is also being used to protect the power grids in this country and in our water systems. So it's very useful. Uh, the last one I'll talk about, blockchain. Uh, does anybody, has anybody heard about blockchain? That is one of the most challenging things to try to figure out. I kid you not. Uh, but but the, the, the best I can, I, I can explain to you is that it's a system of, of linked ledgers, right? Uh, and you kind of know in real time whether or not it's, it's being altered. That's the, my, my best layman's approach to, to, um, uh, to explaining it. The reason that it's important to uh, DHS, and there's a variety of reasons it would be important to us, but... We're interested in uh, using it to uh, secure the supply chain. So DHS kind of owns that mission of, of having a secure supply chain. Uh, and we're, we're doing some pilots uh, with uh, some blockchain pilots with companies in the shipping industries so that we can kind of get after when people are uh, swapping products out and, uh, and hoping to prevent counterfeit products from entering into the country. So blockchain is another very useful technology that I'm seeing. Those are just a handful, uh, just a handful of things that uh, I see uh, evolving in the marketplace and DHS is trying to, uh, to leverage the capabilities there. So how can you help? A couple of thoughts. Uh, if you're interested in either working for the federal government uh, or supporting uh, an industry, um, I would say one of the, the highest, the, the, mo the most highly desired skill sets right now probably is cyber. Uh, although I started the conversation off talking about contracting officers and contract specialists, uh, cyber is, is, is probably one of the hottest career fields right now. Um, we live in the, the Internet of Things, right? So have you, have, have folks in the, in the room with a hand, uh, show of hands. Do you have you heard that term, the Internet of Things? Uh, so we were sitting at the the table a little bit earlier and talking about how, uh, in the not so distant future, we're probably talking a year, maybe less. Who knows? Technology is moving at such a rapid pace. Your refrigerator is going to tell you when it's empty, and then it's going to order the food for you and have it delivered. Right? I'm not making that up. That that's that's coming. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's already happening. I mean, and, and, and the devices in your home are, are connected. So we were also talking about Alexa, right? Uh, so smart speakers, right? Uh, you, you can talk to that thing from across the room, and, and, it, and it knows exactly what you're saying. And uh, it's equipped with artificial intelligence to be able to, to play the next song that you're likely to, to enjoy, right? I mean, I'm just I'm oversimplifying it. But along with that Internet of Things, is something called the surveillance economy. Uh, and I'm sure you'll probably talk to that a little bit um, during your session. Uh, now, I wouldn't be necessarily worried about that, but it's a thing. You, you need to be mindful of the fact that markets are forming around uh, your personal data, right? So as Alexa is capturing information, you know, about your, your consumer um, habits, well, you know, that information is being sold to people, right? So the surveillance economy is here. 
How does that tie into cyber? Well, if your personal information is now floating around, even more so than it, than it has in the past, uh, you want that information protected, right? You want the Apples and the Googles of the world to protect your data. The government wants that too, uh, and we especially want it on our systems. So uh, if, it's, if it's important to all of us in this room as just everyday citizens, it's got to be important to the federal government when you, when you think about the types of systems that we maintain for our defense posture in the country. We can't have those compromised, and so cybersecurity is critical to the U.S. government. Uh, and I think that it's so new, and, it, and it's, it's still evolving in terms of the standards, what, what, how do you define cyber, you know, what, what is it, how do you actually go about it? It's still so new that you can get into it and not be an IT professional today. You can have transferable skills and, and not be an IT professional and still get into uh, to cyber, take some certifications, and, and become a cyber uh, professional. If you're former law enforcement, for example, or if you came from a criminal justice background, um, or if you're a business student, right, uh, you can get into cybersecurity today. Uh, I don't know that it'll be the case 10 years from now, but I think right now is still a prime opportunity. Um, I'm just highlighting that as one career field that I think uh, the skill sets are absolutely critical to the U.S. government. Uh, another thing that I think that um, I kind of wanted to highlight here was uh, not being afraid of advancing technology, right? So this is just my opinion. I, I think the millennials are going to take us to the next level. Okay, uh, millennials have grown up in, a, in an environment where they're, they're kind of used to their private data being compromised, all right? They compromise it. <laughs> or the companies that, you know, they, they give their data to have compromised it, or federal agencies have had breaches and their data has been compromised. They're kind of comfortable with it. I'm not saying they're happy, but they, it's kind of like secondhand, like, yeah, that happens. I think that over time, they're going to be the influencers in society, and they're going to push technology companies to get a little bit more cutting edge and a little bit more creative and a little bit more comfortable absorbing some risk uh, in, in some areas where previously we might not have been able to do that as a society, just my personal opinion. I just offer that uh, as kind of an example of where uh, we shouldn't be afraid of, of trying to advance technology ourselves. And we shouldn't be afraid of uh, technology that, that's growing every day. How many of us, I just got a new phone. Um, I can't figure out how to, how to work the thing. It's the, the iPhone X. It reads my face, I kid you not. Like I don't even put a number in anymore for my passcode. It, I just hold it up to my face and it, and it knows it's me. And I've tested it. I've, I've asked my chief of staff and some other folks, hey, you, try this thing. See if you can get into it. You can't get into it. Uh, I just offer that up because I... I feel like the phone I got two years ago was the latest and greatest. Apparently not, right? Technology is growing at such a rapid pace, we've got to be comfortable with it, right? The, the only thing constant is change. You've heard that. Well, welcome. Welcome to it because it's here. Uh, technology is changing at a rapid pace. Um, and I think we will get left behind if we're not comfortable embracing some of that and trying to advance it ourselves. So I'll end here with a, with a pitch. Uh, I left some, uh, some materials on the table as, uh, as table drops for you, just to kind of give you some thoughts on the, on the Coast Guard itself. Um, we're always looking to recruit talent. Um, take a look at it. Uh, some thoughts on not just contracting, but getting into the federal government in general, if you're interested. And I think we got a couple of folks that, that uh, are either in or, or affiliated with the government, so they may... They may tell you some of this as well. Uh, in our particular job series, uh, you have to have at least 24 business credit hours to get beyond a GS-13, which is kind of a mid-career person. Um, but that could be a mix of things. It could be legal courses. It could be econ courses, finance courses. Um, that's just if you wanted to actually learn more about contract specialist and contracting officer work. Uh, most agencies are requiring that, at least DHS does. Uh, you can still get in. You can get in with an English degree, but in order to progress beyond a certain level, um, you'd have to have business classes under your belt. 
getting away from contracting, though, if you were just, if you were interested in being an HR specialist in the federal government, right, a couple of tips for you. Read very carefully the required documents section of the job announcements. Uh, hopefully, uh, you've heard of USA Jobs. That's, that's the portal that you would go to uh, if you're interested in uh, federal employment. The reason I'm, I'm suggesting that you should pay very close attention to the section that's called required documents is because, unfortunately, there can be disconnects with the rest of how the, the job announcement is written. And unless you, unless you submit every single document that they've asked for in that section, your resume is going to get kicked out and we may never even know that you applied for the job. And that's unfortunate. Um, that happens, though, quite frequently. And we, we hear folks say, hey, I, I applied for the job. Uh, but I, I was told that my application was, was, you know, kicked back. Well, you didn't submit your transcripts. Well, I didn't know I needed to, right? And that's, that, that happens all the time, you know? Um, you've got recourse if you go back to the section that says required documents, and if, if that section didn't ask for it, well, we can do something with that. But if that section said uh, you had to upload your, your transcripts, then... Yeah, we can't help you out there. So pay very close attention to that section. Uh, be mindful of the fact that uh, not every federal agency has the same intake process when it comes to applications and resumes. Some agencies use the, the, uh, the resume builder application that's on the USA job site. Others will direct you to a completely different third-party website altogether. Uh, some will allow you to upload your resume as written. Others will require you to tailor it. Don't, don't wait until the 11th hour thinking that, oh, all I have to do is upload my resume to find that, wait, this thing's going to require me to build it in a completely different uh, uh, application somewhere else, and then you miss the deadline. So just keep that in mind. Um, a lot of agencies use different uh, intake methods. And then uh, be prepared for limited engagement, all right? Uh, things are much different on the federal side. So um, private sector is very active in terms of uh, their recruiting, right? Uh, and, you know, when, they, when they're really interested in you, they're almost courting you, right? We can't do that. Uh, it's almost like when we put a request for proposal out on the street for competition. All the communication with industry has to stop at that point so that the process can be fair and transparent. And so it's the same way on the HR side. Uh, once the job announcement has been posted, there's not a lot of interaction that can happen because we have to maintain a, a fair and transparent process. However, don't be deterred. There's always a point of contact listed uh, on those job announcements. Call those folks and press them for information. Hey, did, can you confirm whether my resume was accepted or not? They can tell you that, right? There are things that they can tell you. So I, I just offer that for you. Um, we do a lot of internships. Uh, we have an internship program at DHS called APCP. That's specific for acquisition and contracting professionals. It stands for Acquisition Career Professional Program. Uh, we'll take folks in uh, right out of college or mid-career, um, and they come in uh, at a junior level, and we get them to a GS-13, which is kind of journeyman, mid-career, in the course of three to four years. Uh, so a lot of opportunities there. Also, uh, every head of contracting activity or every CIO or every uh, chief of uh, human capital, whatever the line of business is, we're all on the public-facing website of an agency. Give it a shot. Pick up the phone, send an email, and send us a note. You never know, you might actually get some traction. Mr. Mike Chabala did just that. Uh, one of your, your counterparts here in the room reached out, and we had a great dialogue, and he said, hey, I'm trying to transition into the federal government. I've been doing this work my entire life. I want to do something different. And, uh, and I said, you know, it would be fantastic if we could get you in here doing some, uh, some work with us while you're completing your studies. And that's what we're doing. So you never know unless you give it a shot, you know. Pick up the phone, send an email, and reach out. Um, we're always interested in folks that want to come work for the federal government. And we can figure out a creative way to get you an opportunity to at least get work experience. Sometimes it's paid, sometimes it's not. But that's still an opportunity to put something on your resume. Uh, so just give that some thought. 
Now I'm going to come back to one final thought. Okay. Uh, again, I got I got to sell my my specific career field in the in the government um, contracting. So there are two million, little over two million federal employees in the country. Less than 1.5 percent of those do contracting in the federal government. Small population. How many of you uh, are doing business degrees or have a business degree? A couple of hands, several hands. Okay, let's talk. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciated the opportunity to come speak to you and good luck on your studies. Take care.